Happy Sunday, everyone. We're glad to be back together and are really looking forward to what these moments together are going to hold. If it's your first time joining in, welcome. I'm glad you're here and hope you have an incredible experience here online. We'd love to let you know more about what goes on here at Christ Chapel and what some next steps could be if you're compelled that way. There's a link in the chat to a few questions. We call it our connect card. We'd love to share some more if you'll just take a second for those questions here as we get started. You'll hear more on that in just a minute. And our team is here for anyone who would like prayer this morning. We'd love to join with you if you'll just click request prayer anytime during the service here online. I'm excited for what's ahead. Let's head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. Will you stand as we begin to worship? We get to as one family, one body of believers, lift the name of Jesus because he's worthy and he's good. So let's sing and celebrate together.
Amen. Church, you can be seated as we continue to celebrate and worship through baptisms. We are going to do just that. We're going to keep worshiping, church. Uh, we're going to worship through this incredible picture of baptisms. We've got four kiddos that we're about to baptize that have really demonstrated childlike faith. A childlike faith as they have put their trust in Jesus Christ, this gospel that we talk about every week, but certainly as we've been going through Romans, this, this justification that's not by our works, it's not by us having all the answers or all the good deeds, but it's by us trusting in the one who has justified us, that's Jesus Christ. And so we've got, we got four kids who we're going to bring out here in a second and, and baptize. And if uh, you've never been a part of one of our baptism services, we're going to worship, right? So as they come up out of the water, uh, just like the angels in heaven, whenever they put their faith in Christ, uh, feel free to lose your minds. Uh, it's, that's up to you guys. Um, we, we see baptism really as this picture of surrender, right? And so even the idea of immersion Baptism and dunking someone underwater, it connects to that idea of, of Paul's testimony in Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. And it's, so it's this idea of, of these four, they've already put their faith in Jesus, but this is a public profession now, that their lives are not their own, dead and buried, their old selves, all of their sin and future sin, dead and buried in the crucifixion and now alive with Christ. That's what this is a beautiful, obedient picture of. So we're excited. Uh, first up, we've got Collins. You guys, give it up for Collins. Collins Wagner. Hi, Collins. Come on up here on this stool. You see this? Yeah. You see your family right here? Hey, guys, little brother. Awesome. Collins, you have put your faith in Jesus, and this childlike faith that you have is this beautiful thing. It means that you are sealed and adopted by a heavenly Father forever and ever. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to baptize you, Collins. Have you put your trust in Jesus fully for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes, she says. All right, then I'm so proud. You can plug your nose here. I'm so proud to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome, awesome. Okay, next up, I think we got Kira. All right, yes. Guys, give it up for Kira. Kira, look at this. You're already pretty tall. Whoa, now you're almost as tall as me. Kira, you are going into sixth grade. You have, even talking to you about your faith, you know, it's like, when did, when did it click? And for you, it was just the more you learned, the more you learned about God, the more you heard about the gospel, you were saying that it was like, why, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I want to give my faith to Jesus? Which is such a cool thing. It's such a cool picture to, to see a young woman say, I'm all in. Um, is that what you're doing today? Have you put your faith in Jesus fully for the forgiveness of your sins? Okay, then I'm so proud to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job. <laughs> All right, next up we've got Henry. Come on out, Henry. Henry Simple. <clears throat> Give it up for Henry, guys. About a year ago, a year ago, Henry wasn't feeling good on a Sunday, right? You were sick at home, uh, and your dad, your sisters, they came to church, but you and your mom stayed home, and you were like, we're going to watch it on TV. And so you were laying on the couch, sick, watching Pastor Cody preach. And you're like, Mom, I think I want to think I want to give my life to Christ, right? You were like, I, I want this. And she was like, well, should we wait for dad to come home? And you're like, no. What does now? I love that. I love that. Henry, your zeal for the Lord, your excitement, even your understanding, as we've talked about this, of this being this picture of what's already happened inside of you is really inspiring to a lot of people. It's really worshipful for us. Have you put your faith in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? then it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, dude. Awesome. And lastly, we have Eden O'Neill. Eden, come on out. <laughs> yeah. Eden, you probably don't need this. I'm going to slide that there. Um, we see Eden good? Okay, good. Eden, your faith uh, has been placed in Christ already, really at a young age. And now you're 11, right? It was probably five years ago, six years ago, you made this decision, but you really wanted to make sure, 
matures and, and you've really understood it and your parents have walked through that with you, but I've not only seen the fruit of, of your faith, but also as you have served my kids in kids ministry week after week after week, and that is a big job. So praise God for that. Um, at a young age, you've not only believed, but you've also already responded to the Holy Spirit as you've served. We're so proud of you as, as a church and we see the fruit in your life. Have you, Eden, put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And I'm so proud to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job. All right, church, let's worship. Church, let's continue to celebrate. Will you stand and worship? I was buried beneath my shame. It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you Two. 
Amen to that. Go ahead and grab a seat. And it's so great to come together and celebrate. We're celebrating, we're seeing pictures of it in the baptisms and in what we're singing, celebrations of the fact that we have been rescued. If you're in Christ, you've been rescued from so much, more than we can ask, more than we can imagine. And when we do that, we are being reminding ourselves that we've been freed because God has loved us, He's cared for us, and that actually frees us to be able to love and care for others who are outside of our immediate interests, if you will. And that's one of the reasons we give. We give, it's, it's an act of worship, trusting God and just celebrating what He's done. And um, we wanna make giving really simple. We have the uh, word that you can text, you know, on the, on, you can, what's that? Text that word or that number to that, text that word to that number. Really messed that up. All right, sorry about that. You can go to our uh, website. There's also boxes out there if you're old fashioned like me and just you know drop your offering in that box. But if you're a guest with us, I do wanna be clear that we don't want anything from you. We consider giving to be a family thing. And uh, we're just glad you're here, honestly. God has a heart for the needy. He has a heart for life, but all of life. And we as a church strive to reflect God's heart in the, way that, in the ways we serve, in the ways we give. We want to love mercy, act justly, and walk uprightly and humbly for God's glory and for the good of others. And one of the ways that we do that is through our partnership with The Net. If you've heard of The Net, The Net is an organization that um, they work against trafficking by working alongside or walking alongside survivors to rebuild their lives and also teaching those survivors what it looks like to embrace their freedom in Christ. 2024 alone has seen a dramatic uptick in the number of women they are serving. There's a 63% increase in the number of survivors they are serving. And this is uh, something the net wrote to us. They said, we are so incredibly grateful for all that the Lord has done in and through the net this year and look expectantly at how he will continue to use us to impact the, the, the next woman who walks through our doors. Thank you, Christ Chapel, for being a part of the network of support for our survivors that lets them know they're worthy. So thank you, Christ Chapel, for partnering with the net, with us as we serve people, hoping to reach them with Jesus Christ and teach them what it looks like to have life-giving freedom. So I wanna pray for um, our offering. I would remind you, if you're interested in the net and learning more about serving there, it's gonna, there's information on the back of your sermon notes. But would you pray with me? Father, thank you for rescuing us in Christ. Thank you for caring for us, for protecting us, for providing for us, and ultimately for loving us. We pray that you would use our offerings to continue to extend that care to those who are vulnerable and needy. Ultimately, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up and that you would draw all men to yourself. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
Well, hello, Christ Chapel. What is going on? It's great to be with you uh, today. Hello to all of you joining us, no matter uh, where you are. And if you're joining us online, thanks for making worship a part of wherever you are, your weekend or your week. Uh, So glad to be able to join you. Uh, Happy Olympics time to everyone. I'm sure uh, you've probably been uh, tuned in to all of those sports, which is Fun, and uh, it's been fun to show the boys random sports that they've never seen, that they're like, is breakdancing a sport? I'm like, it it is, it is. Uh, But uh, certainly the the opening ceremonies, that's a totally uh, different thing. Don't endorse that at all. And just let me just say, guys, uh, don't be surprised when the world acts like the world, okay? Um, it, that, that is what it is, so don't let it take you off guard. I mean, uh, just remember the words of Taylor Swift, a play is going to play and a hate is going to hate, okay? <laughs> so shake it off. Just shake it off, all right? No, remember the words of Jesus too, that, hey, the world is going to hate you because the world hated him first. Uh, don't be surprised when they celebrate things that are ungodly because they don't know God. As such were some of us, as we were in that spot before we came to know Christ as well, which we'll talk more about today. I also want to say a special shout out. Thanks, uh, Matt. Micah did a great job with uh, Romans 3 and Romans 4, but wait, there's more. Uh, I love that phrase, but wait, there's more. You oftentimes hear it in infomercials, which I am an absolute sucker for an infomercial. I tried to think about that. I've only bought something off an infomercial one time, uh, but I am glued to those infomercials whenever I see them. And you go, uh, probably only the short ones, you know, that are like three minutes between your program. Sometimes the 30 minute ones. I mean, like sometimes I am locked in for a whole 30 minutes. Just, it, it's amazing the way that they can stream those things out and the way that they set up uh, the problem, which is sometimes just funny to watch how they uh, exaggerate the problems that are there. And then they offer this solution. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what that solution, I mean, it could be a George Foreman grill, you know, a, a Snuggie. I mean, who doesn't need uh, a Snuggie, we all need one of those, or a retractable hose. Like, gosh, that is the one thing that I'm missing in my life. And you know, that, that's what they're supposed to set up. And you, you start leaning into those things going, yes, I need a, a Snuggie to sit outside and watch the boys play in the Texas heat. You know, that's exactly what I need. And you're leaning in, and it's, as you're leaning in, they always transition with this phrase of, but wait, there's more. And what they're going to do then is pile on this, this avalanche of extras that you go, oh my gosh, this is too good to be true. I have to call now. It doesn't matter what it is. You were leaning into buying one nonstick pan, but did you know that you get a whole set if you call in the next three minutes? And you're like, I have to do that right now. You, you love these, these extras that just get added on, and you're like, you don't just get one shake weight, you get two. You're like, yeah, I love it. I mean, you just, that's what it's all meant to do is to get you to act now. Now, here's why I bring up all of those random examples is because as we've been studying through Romans, we've specifically been talking about justification. This, this idea that, well, it's not, it's not an idea, this theological concept that you can be justified in God's eyes with a one-time act that, that is based on by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And what I mean by that with justification is you can be forgiven of all of your sins judicially, and, and Matt did a great job setting up the judicial aspect in Romans chapter three. You can be declared, uh, not only forgiven of your sins, but declared righteous, that, that you are now seen by God, not as yourself, but you are seen as Christ, Christ's righteousness imputed, given to you. So forgiven of all your bad, given all the good at one time, the gavel goes down, boom, That is a God's declaration that you are forever justified. That is a one-time act that is by grace alone, 
through faith alone, in Christ alone. And both Matt and Micah have mentioned, if you don't know what justification is about and you want to act now, we want you to act now, then there is that wonderful offer on the back of your sermon notes that constantly stays there uh, every week. So please uh, reference that, if you will. Uh, But that is a one-time act. And sometimes we can take our relationship with God as that one-time act, meaning that, yes, I have made that decision. Therefore, I'm so glad that one day when I see Jesus face to face, that he's going to say, hey, I forgave you of all that stuff. And you go, he's not going to be mad at me. And and we look at it as, as justification as simply just one of these blessings in this far, far away land. But, But it's not just that. Being at peace with God has daily benefits, daily extras in a sense that you get. And that's what we're gonna talk about today are the extras that come from being justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So if you will, open your Bibles to Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five. We're going to cover the whole chapter today, but I'm going to kind of do it in a different way. So I would love if you had your Bibles open. If you're opening one of the blue Bibles, it's page 942. Uh, As I said, we've been talking about the the theological concept of justification uh, because we all have that problem of sin. I mean, just just like the, the, the whole way that the infomercial says that you got a problem There's a solution. You've got a problem of sin and you can't work your way out of it. The more you try to dig yourself out of it, the bigger the problem becomes, like a hole. And so you just continue to dig yourself deeper and deeper in this hole. You can't deal with the problem of sin. That's why Jesus came to live the life you could not live. He died the death we all deserved. And by placing your faith, trusting in him and him alone as the only way to be made right with God, that's when that gavel goes down and you are declared righteous. That's what we've been talking about as we've been leading, as we've been coming through the book of Romans. But today in Romans chapter 5, chapter 5 verse 1 starts off with a therefore. And what that therefore is going to do is going to connect us to some of the experiential benefits of being justified by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. It's, it's so therefore, what difference does that make in my everyday life. And that's what he gets into in Romans chapter five, verses one and two. Just follow along with me. He says, therefore, therefore, if we're justified by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, you don't have to show your work as Micah talked about last week. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, that's through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He talks about this one-time act of justification that we now have peace with God, that we are no longer an enemy of God, that, that, that God is for us, he's not against us. And and that is a one-time act that that God uh, initiated when he sent his son. You cannot do anything to merit peace with God. You can't do anything to make peace with God, which is an interesting thing because people talk about that like in death, they're like, you need to make peace with God. You can't make peace with God. You can accept peace with God, but you can't make it. You can't do anything to manufacture it. But when you accept that peace, when you accept Christ's sacrifice for your sins, that's that one time act. But wait, there's more. Because what it says here is, I love how it's phrased and I wanna draw out this nuance because this nuance in the, in the Greek text is going to play out through the rest of chapter five. Because if you look back at Romans chapter five, verse one, where it says, we have peace with God, it makes it sound like that was just based on a past tense thing. Like because we were declared righteous, we now have peace. But actually the way that it's written, it says, let us keep on 
having peace or let us keep experiencing peace or let us keep enjoying peace with God. It's this ongoing effect that it's not just you experienced peace that one day that you place your faith in Jesus and you're so glad that one day in a far, far away land, you'll be at peace with him. There's a huge gap in between that you can enjoy and experience God's peace. All of those extras that you are, uh, you've been waiting for, but guess what? You don't have to wait. There is more, and there's more today in a relationship with Jesus as you walk with him to experience that peace that he offers. And I want to show that to you from Romans chapter 5, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to go through the passage backwards. I'm going to start at the end, and I'm going to come back into verses 3 through 5. And I think it'll make sense because it it starts, the way that I'll start it off at the end of chapter 5 basically will catch us up and kind of be a review of where we've been and then move us into the experiential benefits that I want to highlight today. So the first thing that peace with God provides when he gives us justification is a residence in the kingdom of grace, is a residence in the kingdom of grace. Now, when I say residence, I'm using that metaphorically as a place to dwell, a place to reside, a, a, place, a place to live. That's what I mean by a, a, a residence there. And the reason why I'm, I'm using that is because that's the analogy that he uses in verses 12 through 21. But really, he's building off of what he said there in verse 2, where he says, you've obtained access. It's this idea of you have now been granted a gateway into a new land, into a new territory. And if you look, I love what he says, you've obtained access into this by faith, but into what land? Into a land of grace in which we stand, in which we reside, in which we dwell. This is a, a new place, but you have to leave your old place. When you, when you were justified by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, you moved from the old land into the new land, into a kingdom of grace. And he sets this up with a contrast in verses 12 through 21. And rather than going through the, the verses, I basically, uh, just to expedite our time here. I put it in a chart that's on your sermon notes so that you can see the contrast. Um, and, And if you see, he compares, he talks about the first Adam, which was Adam, and he talks about the second Adam, which was Jesus. And he says that Jesus was a type uh, of, of Adam. And so if you compare and contrast those, uh, the first Adam made from the earth, this is going back to the beginning. This is, again, why we went back to the beginning with Genesis. Remember, we're covering foundational things this year. First Adam made from the earth, disobeyed by eating from the forbidden tree, those nerd clusters, if you remember that. Uh, disobedience, his disobedience brought death, not only to him, but to everyone who has sinned, and we all stand condemned by our own sin. Just in case you say, well, why am I punished for Adam's sin? Because you've added on to it your own, okay? We, we've all, we would all make that same decision because of our sin nature. Second Adam, though, Jesus, came from heaven. This is contrasting here, comparing and contrasting. Obeyed by dying on a, a cursed tree. Instead of eating from the forbidden tree, dies on a cursed tree. And his obedience brought righteousness to all who believe, which is what we've been talking about with justification. And now we stand justified by grace alone. It's only because God is gracious to us. But that moves us into a new territory, a new land, a new residence in which we now stand. This is what it talks about in verse 18. In verse 18, he says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation, this is the, what the first Adam did for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Uh, this, that's the contrast that he talks about that I've just tried to simplify in one verse. But if you look back at that section, you can go back and look at it later, 
One of the things that is through there is the word one that is repeated. One, the, the, the word one is repeated 11 times through those verses. And it's this, this idea that one act, one person, one man brought condemnation for all. One man, one person can bring righteousness and justification to us all. And that all happens with one decision that you can make to place your faith in Jesus. It's just one decision. Stop Stop trusting in whatever you are trusting in to be made right before God and trust in what God has provided, his righteousness through Christ. One decision. That transfers you from Adam, Adam's land, living under the law, trying to earn it, being condemned by your sin into grace, life, freedom. It's a completely new territory. That's the contrast that he is setting up. And so here's an application for us uh, today as we talk about obtaining access into this new land and residing and standing there is this. Demonstrate God's gracious ways as you learn them from the king of grace. Demonstrate God's gracious ways as you learn them from the king of grace. When I, when I think about this shift in territory and now residing in a kingdom of grace, um, grace is a foreign concept in our world, if you think about it. I mean, no one is, uh, well, I take that back. It's very, very rare to see grace lived out in our world. Uh, our world is very merit-based. Our world is cancel culture. Our world is, I mean, like, grace is a foreign concept. And in order to live in the kingdom of grace, you need to learn from the king of grace. You've got to learn a foreign language. But I don't want you to just learn it. I want you to demonstrate. I want, I want you to begin to show that to other people because it's foreign to them as well. Grace is just as foreign. I, I don't know if you've spent a lot of time in foreign countries. I, I have spent a little time, but I've lived the longest. I lived with uh, Jonathan Murphy. You guys know the Irishman. I lived with his, his parents, his family, for two months uh, while I was in seminary. And so I lived in Northern Ireland. That, that was as long as I've lived outside the country. And although they speak English, there are foreign things in that culture. I mean, I... I First, they drive on the wrong side of the road. That, that's foreign. And so I, I had to adjust. I had to learn that, wow, the car isn't coming from that direction. It's coming from the other direction. I've got to look the other way to make sure I don't get run over. But I mean, there, are other, there were other little things. I remember the first time I went to a restaurant and I ordered food and I, I you know, placed my order or whatever. And they said, are you going to eat in? And I'm like, what does that matter to you? And they said, well, it, it costs more if you're going to eat inside the restaurant. If you're going to take the food away, we, you know, basically discount the, the price. And I'm like, okay, that's odd, but I have to adjust. I had to adjust. I mean, they say weird things. I mean, 4.30 isn't 4.30. You say half four. It's weird, people, I'm telling you, okay? <laughs> here's, here's my point. Even though you would go, Cody, it's Northern Ireland. They speak English there. Like, it's, it's the same. No, it's not. And we can become deceived into thinking that the world is, is we're, just like, we're just like everything else and we operate the same. No, we don't. We might speak the same language, but grace is a foreign language. It's a foreign concept. And we've got to learn that concept from the king of grace and demonstrate that to those around us in a way that it, it is foreign in a way that doesn't come naturally to you. It doesn't, and it's uncomfortable at, at first, but it's the land in which you've been transferred. It's the land in which you now dwell. You now live under the sovereignty of the king of grace. Your citizenship no longer belongs to the world of Adam. So live as if you're a citizen of the kingdom of grace. Okay, the second thing that peace does, peace with God provides an assurance of your future destination. Peace with God provides an assurance of your future destination. 
I was thinking about this concept of assurance. And assurance is just hard to come by these days. Assurance in anything. I mean, if you were flying, uh, you know, a week ago or whatever, you're like, yeah, I booked my flight. That should leave around the time that I put there. But you were not assured of leaving within a day, two days of when you had booked that flight. I mean, assurance in some of the most basic things that we think this should work like clockwork doesn't always work. But assurance in your security with Christ and what he's done for you, that, that is a certainty. That, that, that is certain. And I look back at this section in 6 through 11, and it includes one of my favorite verses, which is Romans 5 through 8. But I wanted to read 6 through 8, so follow along with me. It says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. Like maybe if they were a good person, but no, no way for an ungodly person. But, but. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One of my, one of my favorite verses there, Romans 5.8, that God demonstrates his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. And he, he talks about how he did that and when that right time was. If you notice, it says at the right time. What was the right time? Well, we don't know exactly what the right time was in God's mind. Uh, I, I totally trust him. But let me just say this. The right time wasn't when everybody else was good. It wasn't when you were great. That, was, that, that didn't signal, okay, that's the right time to send Jesus. Because if you look back, what was the condition of mankind? They were... Okay, in the text, guys, just keeping in the Bible here. They were, they, they were sinners. They were weak. They were ungodly. I mean, you, you can't get anything further away from God <laughs> than ungodly. I mean, when, when everyone was weak, powerless to save themselves, not bringing anything to the table, and not only not bringing anything to the table, but against God, ungodly, God's enemy. That's when he goes, this is the right time. This is the right time that I'm going to demonstrate my love. And we oftentimes talk about it, and it, it is right to talk about it, as that was the right time that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Absolutely. But if you, I want you to look back at that verb about the right time when God demonstrates his love for us. Is it past tense or present tense? If you look back at that verb, demonstrates. Past or present? Present. It's present tense. And you go, hold on. Wait, God demonstrated his, yes, he did. He did demonstrate his love way back then. But the way that it's written, kind of the same way with peace, keep experiencing peace, keep, keep enjoying that peace with God. The way that it is here, the way that it's written is, God continues to demonstrate his love for you. He continues to demonstrate. He's always demonstrating his love for you in that, while you were weak, Christ died. Meaning that you wake up every morning if you're in Christ, completely at peace with God, justified, living in the land of grace, still weak, still struggling with ungodliness, which we'll talk more about in two weeks, still struggling, still not bringing much to the table. And he goes, you're still mine. I still love you. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to, I'm so glad I woke you up today because I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to continue to show you. I'm going to continue to demonstrate that to you over and over and over again. 
That, that's the verb tense here. And when we know that we wake up, not only assured that one day we will be at peace with God, that when we see him face to face, he's not going to shake his finger at us because he's going to see us in Christ. But we wake up every day going, God saying, I'm going to demonstrate my love to you. I'm gonna, I, did it, I did it once in the most extreme way, and I'm going to continue to show you that day in and day out. That's great assurance for us in what is to come. And so the application for us is this. Align your identity daily to God's love demonstrated continually. Align your identity daily to God's love demonstrated continually. One of the things that I hope for myself and and for us, I, I hope and pray that we wake up every day overwhelmed by God's love. Just absolutely overwhelmed at, at his grace to us. Overwhelmed that he allows us to wake up and he is completely satisfied with us. You see, because in, in our normal minds and in, in Cody's mind every day, and I still struggle with this, I, I wake up thinking that I have to earn everyone's approval the rest of the day. That's how I wake up, is what do I have to do the rest of the day for people to be pleased with me? What do I have to do to be a good husband? What do I have to be, to, do to, to be a good dad? What do I have to do to be a good pastor, a good coworker, a good friend, a good whatever? And, this, and that pressure sits on me just as it sits on you because this is ingrained in us. Again, grace is a foreign concept, foreign language. And, and to, to get up and, and go, God is completely, 100% satisfied with you because of what his son Christ has done and because you've placed your faith in him. The pressure is off. Now you get to go, I'm gonna go love people the way that God has loved me. Now I get to go be gracious to people and I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna disappoint, I'm gonna fall short and I'm just gonna throw myself on the mercy of the court. But that's a different mindset, and that's why I said align your identity. Do you wake up as a worker for God, or do you wake up as a child of God? Two different things. If you wake up as a worker for God, then you go, what do I have to do today to make you happy, God? And we start second guessing all the things that we did or didn't do. I didn't hold the the door for that person. Didn't give that dude money. Uh, Should I have said something here? Should I have do? Hey, be sensitive and follow the Lord's spirit, please. But in the end, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You wake up as a child of God, being loved 100% complete. You can't lose his love, nor could you earn any more. Like, how would that change your day if you woke up and lived your day as a child of God rather than a worker of God? Align your identity. That's that assurance that you have his full satisfaction because he's transferred you from the kingdom that you were in, the kingdom of this world, into the kingdom of grace And then finally, the last benefit of peace, this peace with God that is ongoing. This peace with God provides a joy amidst life struggles. It provides a joy amidst life's struggles. I'm gonna go ahead and admit here as I kind of teach through this part, um, I am the worst at this. I am the worst at finding joy in the midst of struggle. So I fail, okay? So take it as a failure to however you take it, okay? Verses three through five. 
this, remember, this is after, verses three through five come after what? Verses one and two, okay? So one and two, one and two is we have peace with God and we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. It's that idea of permit, and I'm, I'm only recapping here because we've gone backwards, okay? So we've, we backed into this, but I wanted to start at the beginning again. So you've obtained access. You now live in the kingdom of grace. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, at the time that you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. God, the third person of the Trinity who never leaves you or forsakes you, who has been given to us by grace, through faith. That, and therefore, we can rejoice in our sufferings. Now, uh, let me dissect this a, a little bit because when it talks about suffering, uh, the word that is used there is just general suffering. It, it's, it's general, uh, actually some of the other synonyms that are used are uh, distress or pressure. D distress, or, so it's just general distress, trials, pressure. And I love that it's a general word there because what it means is like we can experience this every day because generally we all have pressure. Generally, we all have distress or trials or tribulations, and this is the, the peace that we can continue to experience with God. But it goes on, and it says that we can rejoice amidst that pressure. But it, again, it's not just rejoice one time. This is the same, same way that the peace was written. It says you can keep on rejoicing. You can keep going. You can always rejoice. Why? Because of this almost domino effect, this chain reaction that when you are suffering, your suffering is going to produce something godly. It's going to provide something that God, God is still at work even amidst your suffering. God's at work. He, he is doing something in you. He's doing something in you as he, as it goes on, it says that the suffering produces endurance, this, this perseverance, this I, I can make it, make it through, that God will see me through. And endurance produces character. This character is conviction. Conviction, think, think of convictions of this solidifies. And when it's talking about these things, by the way, Speaking of uh, Olympics, one of the concepts that is used here with these, uh, this Greek verb is the idea of an, uh, an athlete being tested. Like, how do you know if you're fast? Well, you run a race. You know, how do you know what your convictions are until they're tested? And that's this, this testing of the faith, which by the way, it's not just a Pauline concept. If you remember in James chapter one, verse two, it's James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of various kinds or many kinds. And he goes into some of the same kind of effect that Paul is outlining here. So this endurance produces character and this character produces hope. And I love how, how that happens. And I think it's true, I've seen it in, in our congregation's life, I've seen it in my own life, that the more we suffer and the more we bury ourselves into the love of God, the more our hope grows. Our, ho our appetite grows for something that is otherworldly, something that is not here. And I, think, I, I, I know that that's an effect that suffering has in all of our lives, saying to ourselves and reminding us that this is not how God intended. And we're not home yet. And so you go, I want to keep running the race that God has set before. Let me fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. Let me run that race with endurance, as Paul talks about. Let, 
That, that, is, that is what suffering does in our lives amidst so many other things. Now, I want to say two, two things about suffering. This does not mean run foolishly headlong into suffering. That, that's, that's not what it's talking about. And, and I've heard that fallacy before where people are like, oh, that's the hardest thing that could ever happen, so that must be what God wants me to do. Or it could just be foolish. I mean, it could be that, okay? Second, this isn't, this isn't trying to be applied to like masochism, like just enjoy suffering. This is about rejoicing in what God is doing through the suffering because of the things that he's doing, the, the character that he's producing, the hope that is growing. And I love how he says, and hope will not put us to shame, which means hope will not disappoint you. You see, some t- let me tell you, that is one of the biggest hurdles that we have as Christians when we talk about doubt is we doubt, like we say, is it really going to turn out as it says? Am I going to be disappointed one day? I mean, I, I'm going to live my life for Jesus, but is it really going to be worth it? Your hope will not disappoint you. And you say, how do I know that? Faith. And by the way, everybody who saw Jesus and interacted with him, who fell on the mercy of, of him, his mercy, they were never disappointed, ever. And uh, the same is going to be true for you when you see him face to face. So here's an application for me. I think it applies to you as well, but again, I'm awful at this. Rejoice in what God is doing as he shapes you through your suffering. Rejoice in what God is doing as he shapes you through your suffering. You know, there's a, you've heard the phrase before, um, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's something to the effect of uh, sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. You've heard that before? And certainly laughter helps us all. I think laughter is a gift from God, and I hope your life is full of joy and laughter. But it's okay to be sad, too. Sadness is okay. Sadness reminds us that we're not home yet. And remember what, it's, what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We can grieve. We should grieve. But we don't grieve without hope. And so my, my challenge for myself is when I'm struggling and when I'm sad and when I'm experiencing the, the struggles of life and all those things that I struggle with or struggle against, to not try to cope with that with the way that the world copes with that, but to just rejoice. And you say, how, how do you do that? I, I don't know. Accept that. I try to do it with faith. With faith. And I just go, in faith, I'm going to pray. And in faith, I'm going to rejoice. And in faith, I'm going to worship. And in faith, I'm going to sing. Because I know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who believes in him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so I'm going to go, he's going to reward it. He's he's going to come through. He's going to shape me. He's going to shape and form my character. He's going to produce endurance. It's going to produce hope. Because without hope, we're all destitute. And that's what Jesus came to bring, is not just justification and peace with God, but hope for what he's gonna do. And that's what we cling to today. That's what we walk with him for. So don't miss out. Act now. (laughs) Don't wait, because there is more. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you that you are a God who can be trusted. When we think about all the things that are uncertain in life, you are certain. And we know that because you have fulfilled every prophecy, every promise up until this point. Why would you stop? 
And so, Lord, uh, even amidst the, the struggles and the pressures and the trials of life, thank you that it is well with our souls. So may we keep on experiencing that peace and enjoying living in the kingdom of grace and rejoicing that you know us as your child. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship? Grand earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all It is well for me to not believe even when my eyes can see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my
it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well with me. Church, we can rejoice in our suffering because we have faith and hope in a God who's been consistent and faithful and true. So let's continue to sing to him. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me For me, for me Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. upon the lonely I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David who made a shepherd born courageous I may not face Goliath but I've got my
Amen. So encouraging to know that it is the same God. So we can look back on how he was faithful uh, to his people all throughout scripture and go, he's going to be just as faithful uh, to us. If you're a guest, so glad that you chose to join with us today and spend some time with the Christ Chapel family. These are wonderful, wonderful folks uh, that you're around. I, I love dearly and I know that they want to love on you. We'd just love to get to know you more. And so if you'd like some more information or you have some questions or just want to know some next steps about how you can connect to Christ Chapel or even with Christ, then please go out into the great room. You'll see a screen that looks like that, and uh, they will answer any questions that you have about the church and give you some of those concrete next steps. Also, if you need prayer for anything, that is one of the ways that that we demonstrate our faith and, and trust in God, and He builds that character and endurance in and through us is through prayer. And so if you're struggling through anything, would love to be able to pray for you. We'll have some folks down here on our prayer team that would love to be able to lift up uh, anything you have. But uh, I pray that you would uh, take these scriptures to heart, that you would align your identity with him, that you would keep on experiencing that peace and made available uh, through Christ this week. So go walk in peace with him. God bless you. We love you. See you next week. We've had a great morning with you and are so glad you joined in. We're still here for a few minutes if there's anything we can be praying for today and through this next week. We'd be honored to join with you in prayer. And as always, if anything comes up during the week you'd like prayer for, and if you have any questions, let us know. We'd love to help however we can. Until we're back together next Sunday, have a great week, and we'll see you then.